This is Matt Schlenker from the University of Toronto presenting on why gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy has become my primary approach for surgical management of uveitic glaucoma. Here are my disclosures. So why GAT? I'm gonna be provocative here and say that this is likely the single most dramatic paradigm shift in my practice over the past five years. So first, why not? We've had efficacy concerns, particularly for our primary uh, glaucoma subconjunctival filtering approach, a trabeculectomy. And we've always had ongoing safety concerns with trabeculectomies, but this is particularly true for this patient population. What about tube shunts? Well, they do appear to have better efficacy than trabeculectomy. This is in contrast to, say, a typical glaucoma patient where the evidence, I would say, says that trabeculectomy likely has better outcomes. Also, on the safety side, it seems that tube shunts, particularly the valved tube shunts, such as the Ahmed, have fewer complications, though complications are still an ongoing issue. I also just want to point out that across all of the glaucoma surgery literature, having inflammation control appears to help with the glaucoma surgery outcomes. So to the extent possible, it is great to get these people on steroid sparing agents, suppress their, uh, their inflammation, which not only helps for the surgery itself, but also in the post-operative uh, recovery. So here are some of these devastating complications. So hypotony maculopathy affects the central vision and sometimes is irreversible. Here I am, uh, unfortunately, I've done uh, several of these now. I've had to plug uh, tubes due to hypotony maculopathy. You can see here, I actually melt the end of either a two or a three-o nylon uh, before placing it into the tube. And sometimes, unfortunately, they get IOP spikes after and this melted and allows us easily to retrieve this plug if necessary. This just kind of puts it all together. We can see a decompensated cornea and also a fairly significant uh, exposure that we first try to repair primarily, uh, which is often difficult. And you can see that this is a difficult situation on many levels. So the hypothesis for many of these patients is that they have a trabecular meshwork problem so why not target that particular program problem and enhance the natural physiological outflow of the eye? And it's nice because you don't need a lot of instruments and you don't need to leave hardware uh, in the eye. So I'm going to just show uh, one of my uh, videos of this approach. Many surgeons consider a tube shunt in young uveitic patients. And I want to show a technique that I've had a fair amount of success with, uh, goniosneculysis and gonioscopy-assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. Here I am making a paracentesis using a 27 gauge needle by the 5-0 proline, and then just used a 15 degree blade for a main incision, some preservative-free lidocaine, followed by some cohesive viscoelastic. And generally I do not use uh, myocol, uh, but did in this situation, just because she has a clear crystalline lens, and I knew I was gonna be doing some goniosneculysis as well. Now, this is just using a Swan uh, Jacob lens, uh, looking at the nasal angle, and you can see just using an MVR blade how easy her peripheral anterior sinecii came down, uh, despite uh, me seeing these peripheral anterior sinecii some six months ago. And this... Okay, so we ended up doing the goniosinecheolysis 360 degrees. I'm just going to skip that and go into the GAT. So here we are just... Uh, finishing it. We actually didn't even have to grab onto the iris there. So now we're just using an MVR blade to make an approximately one clock hour goniotomy. So cutting right through the center part of the trabecular meshwork, uh, exposing Schlem's canal. You can see the outer wall there quite nicely. We have a melted tip 5 proline already in the anterior chamber, and you can use a variety of micro instruments to feed this proline into Schlem's canal. And then I do approximately 10 pushes to go 180 degrees around Schlem's canal. I used to go 360 degrees, though I'm not really sure uh, the efficacy is that much better. And it probably does lead to more chance of bleeding postoperatively. So here I've done my 10 pushes and I just bring the suture out of the eye and that's it. It's a fairly uh, quick uh, procedure. 
I do leave some viscoelastic in to keep the eye pressure up in the early postoperative period to decrease the risk of our most frequent complication, uh, which is hyphema. Of course, leaving viscoelastic in can lead to IOP spikes though as well. So I just wanna share some of our data. We've been doing this for some time now, and I've just combined my data with Dr. Pat Gouis from the University of Calgary. So we have some 33 patients now with uh, reasonable follow-up, and they come from a diverse background of different types of uveitic glaucoma, and approximately half were done on a standalone basis and half were combined with cataract surgery. I'll also point out that our subconjunctival filtering surgery likely takes an efficacy hit when we combine it with cataract surgery, but I do not think that's the case for GAT. In fact, they may be synergistic procedures. So just looking at our results in aggregate, we had a significant IOP reduction, significant medication reduction, and almost two thirds of these patients were on oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, and very few have, have been on them afterwards. This is just looking at a scatter plot of the IOP, you can see that we were not just dealing with a, a typical MIGS population here. These patients had pressures, uh, one had over 50, we had multiple in the 40s and 30s, and you can see quite good IOP control with some medications for some patients uh, after this procedure at 12 months. And this is just our Kaplan-Meier curve. Now, depending on how you define uh, success, there's a little bit of debate exactly how we should define that. We're looking at somewhere uh, as high as 80% or in the 70% at, uh, at 12 months uh, with this approach, which again, you have to keep in mind that efficacy has always been a concern uh, in any glaucoma surgical outcomes for this patient population. Hyphema, as I said, is the most common uh, complication it is largely self-limited. I've done hundreds of these now. I have not had to do an anterior chamber washout in the uh, OR yet. Uh, it may happen in the future. Generally, some patience is what's needed, and they can have IOP spikes uh, from the hyphema, perhaps from the steroids, or from the underlying uveitis itself. So I do warn them for the first two weeks, they got to take it very easy, and they may have a little bit of a roller coaster uh, after this approach. So I feel like we're all kind of firefighters, you know, dealing with this different difficult patient population. I just want to kind of drive home uh, three points here. The first one is I strongly suggest considering this stepwise approach almost for all the patients, particularly for young patients with mild disease with controlled inflammation and minimal PAS. I also just want to reiterate the importance of ongoing inflammation control heading into the glaucoma surgery and then postoperatively. And I think it is great if we can get systemic steroid sparing immunosuppression on board. And finally, I've had several patients who undergone cataract surgery uh, with their uveitic glaucoma and had significant decompensation in their eye pressure postoperatively. So I would strongly consider adding GAT for patients who've had IOP issues or who have significant medication uh, burden. I think it can really uh, uh, help in the short and long term for them. Thank you.